1 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, my, uh, my dog loves to eat anything that flies, namely like big, fat, black fly. If he sees them, he eats them. And that's just, that's just the way it goes. So it's good for us because if there's a fly in the house, we just call him over and he'll, he'll take care of it for us. Uh, recently, not too long ago, I looked out my backyard and noticed that there was something a little weird in the backyard. And I, as I walked over, I realized that a swarm of bees had created a, a house for themselves in my backyard. And I didn't think about it, but when my dog saw me go over there, he looked outside and he thought, there's a lot of stuff to eat. So he runs outside and he, he, he gets one, he eats it, and it stings him in the mouth. And he turns around, he runs inside, and he goes and hides in the corner. It's like, you're, you're a wimp. You know, he's like a wimp swim dog. So he, he gets stung in the mouth. And it just, it occurred to me, like, wh- why bees? Like, really, I mean, I have these, I have thousands of bees in my backyard. If my kids go outside, if I go outside, I'm going to get stung. My dog just got stung. Why bees, really? I mean, why did God make bees, of all things? Why, why? They seem just like they fly around us, they sting us. That's kind of what they do. And the more I thought about it, the more it dawned on me that I needed to do some research on bees. Why bees? And so I did. So I went and looked, okay, what, what do bees do? I know we get honey from bees, that's great, but is there anything else that we get from bees? And it, and it it came pretty quickly that, yes, we do. We, there's a lot of things we get from bees. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of foods we eat that if we, didn't, if we didn't have bees, likely we would not be able to consume them or enjoy them. And let me just give you a list of, of f- foods that you would not be able to enjoy if it were not for the honeybee. Here it is. This is just a small sampling. Almonds, apples, asparagus, beans, blackberries, blueberries, cabbage, cantaloupe, cauliflower, celery, cherries, cranberries, cucumber, grapes, kale. Who likes kale? But the kale, uh, lettuce, mustard, onions, peaches, pears, plums, radishes, raspberries, rhubarb, squash, strawberries, sunflowers, sweet potatoes, watermelon. The list goes on and on and on and on. Any of those foods, if you like them at all, you can thank the honeybee. So the next time, instead of killing it, just thank the Lord for the honeybee because the honeybee allows us to consume these foods, and this is why. The honeybee and these seed-bearing plants live in a state of mutual interdependence. And what I mean by interdependence is that they're two separate things that depend on one another for growth and survival. The honeybee needs the plants. To, to grow and to survive and to, to function properly. The, those seed-bearing plants need the honeybee or else they would die off. They would not create these, these foods that we eat. They depend on one another for growth and survival. They are mutually interdependent. Now, I'm not going to go into the, the science of why, but let me just give you a, maybe a Cliffsnose version um, because that's all I understand. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to give you what I understand here on, on why this works. What does this look like, this interdependence? Here's what it is, and you guys probably can think back to class. You understand this as I start talking about it. These, these seed-bearing plants create these flowers that are bright, and the reason they do that is to attract the honeybee because the honeybee lands on it. The honey, honeybee needs nectar to create honey, so it, it knows that's where it finds it. So it goes to these plants, and it lands on it, and it create, brings the nectar out, and it goes from plant to plant to plant with trying to get nectar so it can go back and make honey. It needs the plants to do that. Without the plants, it wouldn't be able to do it. The other way around, the plants need the honeybee because when the honeybee lands on that plant, it, cre- it releases pollen onto the underside of its legs and of its belly. Pollen, some of us hate pollen because it makes us sneeze. The, but it, it also, it, it moves, through, it pollinates other plants. So as the honeybee lands on that plant, pollen brushes off onto the bee, goes to the next plant, and it pollinates, it fertilizes it. Without that fertilization, we don't get almonds and apples and asparagus and cucumbers and whatever else I named. They're mutually interdependent. They need each other for growth and survival to function properly or else they would not function the way that God made them to function. It wouldn't work that way. They're mutually interdependent. Now, we could take time and spend a lot of time probably on a sermon about God's glory in creating plants that are colorful to, to attract a bee. I mean, that's God's purposes in creation. We could spend a sermon on that. That's not this sermon. What I want you to see and understand this morning 
is that this honeybee and these seed-bearing plants, like they are interdependent and work on each other and work with each other, that is very, very similar to what we're going to talk about this morning as we ordain and install Jamie's self as an elder. See, Jamie as an elder and Chris as an elder function in a way with the church, with you, that, sh- that should lead to joyful interdependence. It actually, it, it does. For them to function properly, they need you. And for you to function properly, you need them. You, you the church, and the elders function together in a state of mutual interdependence. You are dependent on your pastors to watch over you, to shepherd you, to teach you so that you may grow. And pastors... You need the church to help you thrive and live properly, both as pastors and as men. And beginning today, this, when I say pastors of Grace Church in Peoria, I don't just mean Chris, I also mean Jamie. Jamie, you are dependent on the church. And church, you are dependent on him. And to, to further see this, so that I'm not making this up, I want, I want to look at a, a charge that Paul gives to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4. He's instructing Timothy on how he should think about his role as a pastor. So to that end, let, let me read through part of this section. I'm going to focus on verse 16, but I want to read a little bit before then too, to, just so that we can get some context. And then we will we'll unpack this a little bit and see how this applies to to you as this church and Jamie as an elder. Just a reminder, this is the word of the Lord we're about to read this morning. May its truth be written upon our our hearts. I'm going to begin in verse uh, 6 of chapter 4. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. He's talking to Timothy. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Go down to verse 13. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. And then our verse, verse 16. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing you will save both yourself and your hearers. Mutual interdependence. This verse, verse 16 gives the pastor two charges. It says to keep a close watch on himself and to keep a close watch on his teaching. I actually, I actually like the way the NIV says it very succinctly where it says watch your life and doctrine. Watch your life and doctrine. And those are our two points for this morning. As we think about this interdependence, we're going to look at it through the lens of these two charges to the pastor. So the first is watch your life. Now, Paul here was writing to Timothy, who was his protege, I guess a young pastor here in Ephesus, which was a church that Paul planted, that Paul really cared about. The church in Ephesus is perhaps the most discussed church in the New Testament. It was a a major port city for Rome, but it was also a tourist attraction because it was home to the great temple of Artemis. The temple was a, a shrine to this fertility goddess Artemis or Diana and was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. In fact, in terms of a tourist attraction, Philon of Byzantium said this about this tourist attraction of the Temple of Artemis. He said, I have seen the walls and hanging gardens of ancient Babylon, the statue of the Olympian Zeus, the Colossus of Rhodes, the mighty work of the high pyramids and the tomb of Mesolus. But, he says, When I saw the temple of Ephesus rising to the clouds, all these other wonders were put in the shade. Meaning that this was magnificent. This was a destination spot. People came to see this. 
People wanted to be around this. They wanted to understand how great it was. They, they had heard about it, and they were going to travel to Ephesus to see the temple. This city was a buzzing city. It was a tourist city. It was a port city. It was an important city for Rome, and it was a dark city. It was a dark city in the worship of pagan gods. It was a dark city in the practice of cult prostitution. And we see in Acts, if you remember in Acts 19, it was, it was a dark city in the dislike of Paul in Christianity because you remember Demetrius, the silversmith, hated the gospel. He, he had a, there was a riot in Ephesus because he hated what they were preaching because it was going to take away from his trade, which was creating these, these sh- little shrines to Artemis, and everybody got into an uproar in Ephesus because of it. They didn't like the gospel. And here Paul leaves this church in this city, this dark city, in the hands of his young student, Timothy. And as we read 1 Timothy, it becomes clear that Paul was eager for Timothy the pastor in the midst of all this craziness, all this this hubbub and this this busyness of life here, this darkness in Ephesus. He He was eager for Timothy to watch his own life. He was eager for him to watch his practice of holiness, his practice of Christ's likeness. <clears throat> because as we see in the character qualifications for an elder in both 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, the pastor should be an example. The pastor should be a light to the church in the midst of darkness. The pastor should be an example to the church and to the community of what a Christian ought to be. Doesn't mean that the pastor's perfect, because the pastor's not perfect. Pastors are not perfect. If you think pastors are perfect, please erase that from your minds. Not perfection, but striving to be like Jesus in every way. We we read this. We read this list that pastors are called to be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, not a drunkard, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not greedy, greedy or a lover of money, not a recent convert in case of power temptations, managing his own household well, Thought well of by outsiders, humble, a lover of good, upright, disciplined, holy. To this the pastor is called. The pastor is called to be striving for this, an example this way. And so Paul charges Timothy to watch his life in the midst of this city. Be careful. Watch your life. Keep a close watch on yourself so that you don't fall into sinfulness disgracing this gospel which you are called to preach, disgracing the name of Christ, dishonoring Him and His name, leading the church into some sort of disillusionment by sinfulness. Once you're you're preaching one thing and then all of a sudden you're doing another, you're saying, no, no, watch your life, Timothy. This is a dark city. It's a dangerous place. And Jamie, starting today, this is also your calling here. This is the charge that Paul gives to you as well, to watch your life. Jamie, your life is no longer your own. It is a life lived for Christ and for this church. Work hard to grow in your personal devotional life, which I know you do, and to be holy, to be an example to your family, which I know you are, to Andrea and Mackenzie and JJ, though I know they're at Hillsdale, I just remember them when they were little. To the members of Grace Church Peoria, to the rest of the community in Peoria, to the West Valley, and all for the glory of God. Jamie, you, called, you are called by Paul, by the Lord himself, to watch your life. And church, let me say what many of you that have known Jamie and know Jamie already know. He's a godly man. I know that you know that he exemplifies this charge as he's watching his life, but he's still called to do so. Because the pastor's calling is a dangerous calling. It really is. It's a dangerous calling. Because Satan just does not like the message that men like Jamie are eager to preach, which is, which is preaching Christ eternal, Christ incarnated, which we celebrate at Christmas time. Christ who has lived a perfect life and who died on the cross and who rose again from the dead and who is reigning now forever. 
Satan does not like that message because it means doom for him. This is something that, that Satan doesn't like. It's a dangerous calling to be a pastor. And this is where you come in as a church. You see, 1 Timothy was written to a pastor about how he is to act and serve the church. However, I think if Paul were to write a letter called Peoria to you as a church, members, on how to respond to your pastors, how to interact with your pastors, I think, I think that he would instruct you here to help Jamie and to help Chris watch their lives, to be a help to them. You see, you have to understand, before Jamie or Chris are pastors to you, pastors to this church, they are simply members of this church. They are members of this church just like you. They aren't super members of this church. They aren't members with exemptions, somehow above the fray, like they don't need to obey the Bible because they're pastors. Or, or they don't have friendships in the congregation because they're pastors. They're not members with certain privileges that you don't have. No, they are simply members of this church who have been gifted and who have been called to serve this church in a leadership teaching kind of way. That's their calling. You all serve the church in a certain way. We, we, we experienced it this morning, music, right? We, we all sang because of the gifts that the Lord's given to these people to serve the church. There's people right now with children in the back teaching children. There are people that greeted you on the way in. There's people that made coffee. There's people that are doing sound right now. The people that lead small groups or, or other groups throughout, throughout the church, whatever it is, there's, there's a number. Everybody in this church functions in a serving kind of way at some point. Could be in hospitality, could be in fellowship, whatever that way is, they as pastors are called to serve this church with the Word and with leadership. They're called to shepherd you under the great shepherd, to be an example to you, to teach you. And they today, including Jamie, aren't, accept, aren't exempt from Hebrews 13.3 though, which says, exhort one another every day as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. They, they, they still have that charge against them as pastors. As members of this church, Jamie will watch his life, but he needs you also to help him watch his life. As, as a church, as church members, as friends, to help him watch his life, to preach the gospel to him when needed, to encourage him when needed, to be friends with him, to watch him. And, and one thing that I'm actually really encouraged by, and you should be encouraged by this too, I was recently talking with Chris. Chris. And we were talking about you. And he was saying how patient you all are with him. He was, just, he was just glowing over you, how patient you are with him to care for him and his imperfections as a pastor, how grateful he is for that. He was saying that you encourage him in his growth. You forbear with his weaknesses. You are gracious with him in your correction. This is all his language. This isn't, this isn't mine. You long to see him thrive in his role to build him up. And this is what I'm talking about with your pastors. I'm so grateful you already do it. I'm grateful that you already do it with him. And now that same mindset and attitude should also be applied to Jamie. How you treat and interact with Chris should also be applied to Jamie. He is your pastor. He is your friend. He is a fellow member of this church. You see, you are interdependent with one another. Church, you need Jamie to be an example of godliness and holiness and Christ-likeness for you. And Jamie, you need, to be, you need this church to help you watch your life. It's, it's part of the interdependence, this mutual interdependence, the joy that you get to have together as pastors and as, as a local church. Jamie, you, like Timothy, are called to watch your life and to be holy. But you, like Timothy, must be sure that holiness and Christ-likeness have their proper place in your theology and your teaching. Because holiness and Christ-likeness are responses. They're responses. They, they aren't means. And what I mean by that is that you aren't a Christian because of how godly you were at the time. You are godly because you have received grace and are now in Christ as a Christian. And Paul wants to make sure that, that Timothy, here in 1 Timothy, and you keep that properly 
placed in your theology, in your teaching. The gospel of Jesus is the foundation for godliness. And this leads to Paul's second charge. It's my second point, which is watch your doctrine. We had watch your life. Now it's watch your doctrine. You see, it's clear through this letter to Timothy in Ephesus that Paul has a concern with this church. Paul has a concern with this church in Ephesus. And here's what the concern is. They are prone to leaning towards legalistic, self-righteous, law-driven piety. At least, at least there's a temptation from, you know, from the outside to bring into this church for those kinds of things. And it lacks appropriate gospel motivation and teaching. Paul's concern is not that they're godly because godliness is something we should be striving towards in Christ. He's not talking about genuine Christ-honoring holiness. It's not what he's talking about. He's concerned about legalistic moralism. He's concerned that, that this teaching, that you need to do this or that to get justified before God, you have to be a certain way or do certain things to, to gain justification or acceptance from God, it is something that Paul is concerned about with this church. Paul does not want Timothy to teach it. Jesus hated that. You take a look at the Pharisees. Jesus did not like that. It's just outward show for outward show's sake, and then you're holy. No, no. There's something more here to be said and more to be had, and Paul is concerned that the, that kind of teaching, that I need to do certain things in order to gain you know, acceptance or justification with God first as my, as my grounds for, for, for justification or acceptance, those kinds of things is a con are a concern for Paul in this church in Ephesus. We see in verse 7, if you look at your Bibles, that Paul doesn't want Timothy to what he says has, have anything to do with irreverent, silly myths. And, and what he's talking about there is abstaining from foods or abstaining from marriage or whatever, whatever other ascetic things, you know, let me distance myself from these things that are very good things just because it's, it's holy or it seems better or that's a good thing now. It's like these extra biblical things thrown on top. Paul does not want that. Rather, Paul wants Timothy to preach the whole counsel of God, creation of mankind, fall of mankind in Adam, the redemption of mankind by the plan of God through perfect li the perfect life, death, resurrection of Jesus, holiness and sanctification. Yes, this happens for those who are in Christ, and being made in His likeness, holiness and purity in Christ, motivated by gospel grace, certainly, and the final marriage supper of the Lamb where we will see Him and be with Him for eternity. Preach it all in its proper place, in its proper timing, understanding the nuances of the gospel. You see, the, the gospel isn't a message of justification through behavior. Rather, it's justification through a Savior, Behavior comes after I'm, I'm saved by God through Christ. Then I work on, on my life and I grow and sanctification takes place. The difference is, is that we are called to work at holiness because of what Christ has done for us. Christ has worked in us and therefore we work to be like Him. See, the pastor's responsibility and charge is to keep a close watch on what he preaches, on what he believes so that the church doesn't stray into moralism for salvation as an example. If we were preaching, if, if this was a different letter, there'd be a different danger that we could talk about. This is the danger that Paul sees in Ephesus, and so therefore that's the danger we're talking about here. But, but it could be a whole number of errors that he could be telling a bunch of other different pastors here. This, the, the message is still the same. Pastors, watch your teaching. Watch your teaching. He tells Timothy, keep a close watch on your teaching, on your doctrine, so as not to veer away from the foundation of gospel grace. A pastor who doesn't watch his doctrine and teach holiness by gospel grace is not a Pauline pastor, according to 1 Timothy 4.16. The pastor must hold on to Christ, read about him, study him, find him in the scriptures, and teach that to the church. And Jamie, you must do this with this church. It's your calling. Fight for it in your teaching, in your preaching, in your counseling, in your shepherding, in your correcting. Any type of aspect where this teaching takes place, fight for this. Watch your doctrine. 
Your charge is to watch your doctrine, hold on to the truths of the word, and teach them with boldness. You must not give in to the temptation of the culture to preach whatever is the next fad. You must not give in to the temptation of the culture to preach just something that sounds good, tickling ears, or talking about your best life you can live here now, or something. Rather, preach the things that per perhaps are uncomfortable to teach in the culture. Blood, cross, empty tomb. Christ is the only way. Preach it. Preach it with boldness and confidence. Watch your teaching. Watch your doctrine. This church depends on you to do this. You know, one look at the seven churches in Revelation. If you were to read in Revelation, you see that, that preaching Christ crucified isn't just nice to have in a church. You go to Revelation, you, you, you read about the seven churches that are found there. It's not just nice to have, it's essential for the church's survival. And church, as Jamie watches his doctrine, he's dependent on you to do this as well. Because first, you, you must be like the church in Berea in Acts 17 which is commended because as Paul's preaching to them, they're searching the Scriptures and saying, okay, yeah, that's found here. Yep, that's exactly what I see. Be a church like that for your pastors. Say, yeah, is this, this is right. This is good. Be like that church in Berea. Watch the Scriptures. And if Jamie or Chris strays from preaching Christ in His fullness, help them. That's first. That's first, you must have that, but I'm confident, knowing these two men, that your calling here is more joyous. See, your calling also is to listen and apply the counsel and the teaching, to enjoy the pastoring that is preached, that Jamie will preach and teach, that Chris will preach and teach and shepherd, holiness by gospel grace. See the, see the growth in your life because of it. Watch them enjoy it, grow in it. Jamie, you are called to watch your life. You are called to watch your doctrine, to persist in this, Paul says, to persevere in this, he says. And church, I, I just want you to see that it's really interesting, might be a good word, the effect that this watching of life and doctrine that Jamie will do and that you will help him do, that the, the effect that this will have we see that in verse 16. As Jamie closely watches his life and doctrine, as you help Jamie watch his life and doctrine, it says in verse 16 that as this happens, he will save both himself and you. Now you, you read that and you hear it and you kind of think, oh, that doesn't sound right. That, that just some, there's something about that that does not sound right. For by so doing, you, meaning Timothy, will save both yourself, Timothy, and your hearers, the congregation. That applies here. Sounds heretical, doesn't it? Sounds like that's, that's not right, but that's what Paul says. Now here's what this doesn't mean. This doesn't mean that by... Jamie's working, you will be saved. Jamie is not Jesus. It doesn't mean that through Jamie's actions, he can save you. That's Jesus' job. It's God's work. God does that. That's not what Paul means here. Paul doesn't mean if you do a lot of good things and teach to them, everybody's going to get saved just through you. That's not what he means. Your pastors don't have the power to do that. They don't have the power to save you. But here's what he does mean. As Jamie is watching his life, and Chris is watching his life and watching his doctrine, striving to be like Jesus, keeping an, eye, keeping an eye on himself and on his teaching so as to preach the whole counsel of God. And as you are helping him to do those things, and he continues in, in that, and we see that he persists in this, as that happens, God will use Jamie as your pastor to help you persevere in your faith to the very end. As, as Don Carson, the theologian, says, perseverance is the definition of what it means to be a Christian. Meaning that it's a, it's a race run. 
And as Jamie is watching his life, as he is watching his doctrine as one of your pastors, as you are helping him to do those two things, his life, his example, his teaching will help you to persevere and run your race to the end. That is an amazing calling. That's a joy that you get to have together in the race of the Christian life. To walk with your pastors and have your pastors walk with you. To find yourself in the end. What a calling. Who is sufficient for these things? By God's grace, Jamie is, since he is called to be a pastor here. Now listen, and I'm, I'm finished, but listen, Jamie and Grace Church, you are interdependent, joyfully so. Joyfully interdependent. Jamie, you need the church to help you thrive as a pastor and as, and as a man. And church, like you do with Chris, Jamie needs you to encourage him in his gifts, to forbear with him in his weaknesses as a fellow sheep, to be gracious with correction when needed, and long to see him thrive in his role, to watch him, help him watch his life, help him watch his doctrine. Because church, just like you need Chris, starting today, you need Jamie too. You need him to help you grow. It really is a, a beautiful partnership. And as a friend to these men, and as a as somebody who, who gets to interact with a number of different churches in the, in the West, I love this church. I love these two guys. And I'm eager to see how God uses both Chris and Jamie to help you run your race, persevering to the end. Let me pray for us. Father, our, our hope this morning, even as we, we sang earlier, has nothing to do first and foremost with us. It is all placed upon your Son. And the calling to be a pastor is not something that we take lightly. I know it's not something that Jamie takes lightly or Chris takes lightly. The calling to be a pastor is one that you work in us. And as, as these two men shepherd and lead this church, I pray for growth spiritually in terms of depth. I pray that people that don't know you today in this area would come to know you because of this local church and these pastors. Lord, all, all the things that we do are dependent and they're dependent on you. Both Chris and Jamie are dependent on you. This church is dependent on you. Together, the churches and pastors are interdependent on each other. That's how you made it. And we ask this morning that you would continue to be at work. Thank you for calling men like Jamie to be pastors. And thank you for calling men like Jamie to be a pastor here. And we pray that you would work it all for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen.